I didn't touch it, so I they so usually. Huh? Uh, do you want to put them on the chairs and turn them off because they're removing the darkness? Okay. Well, we got to make sure. Well, yeah. I forget to turn them on when we do. Okay. Them. Hello. 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 <laughs> Hello. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me? I don't know. It needs to be turned up. I was just going to make an announcement. Welcome, everyone. We're going to get started here in about two or three minutes because the, uh, there's quite a long line in the downstairs, and we want people to get a chance to come in. But if you'll take your seats, we'll get started here in just a couple of minutes. Okay, I'm, I'm hearing that uh, the line isn't as long as I thought as it was downstairs, so maybe we'll get started. We do have um, an overflow room. Unfortunately, we only have uh, a standing room or very little space in this room at this point, but if you would like to join us in the overflow room, it's on the fifth floor just downstairs. Um, and uh, thank you. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for... Um, your patience in getting into the building this morning. There was another event on, on Asia, and uh, so it was kind of a perfect storm down there, but we appreciate your patience and your being here. I want to welcome you to our event, our crime and violence prevention programs working in Central America. Um, my name is Eric Olson. I'm the Associate Director of the Latin American program here at the Woodrow Wilson Center, and I want to uh, thank you all for being with us for this interesting uh, discussion this morning. Uh, before I get going, I'd like to just acknowledge a few uh, special guests this morning. Uh, Cindy Arnson is the director of the Latin America program here, and we'll welcome her. Uh, a special welcome to our colleagues and friends from USAID who are co-partnering, co-hosting, co-organizing this event, uh, especially Mark Fierstein, the associate administrator at USAID, and also, as if that weren't enough, the assistant administrator for Latin America and the Caribbean. Mark, it's always great to, to have you with us. And, uh, and also, I'd like to just also acknowledge a great friend and, and colleague over the years, Enrique Roig. He's USAID's coordinator for the Central America Regional Security Initiative uh, in Central America, and we're always delighted to work with you. And then if I can, just acknowledge somebody who's uh, been here at the center before, former Deputy Mayor of Los Angeles, Guillermo Cespedes. Um, a lot of us have learned a lot from your experience with gangs and youth violence in Los Angeles and your concern about Central America. So we're delighted that you are joining us as well. Um, as many of you will remember last summer, wasn't that long ago, there were many, many news stories, uh, images, of young Central America children arriving at the U.S. border, some of them as young as five and six years old, unaccompanied. In June, as many as 10,200 arrived. In July, it was up to 10,600. And while it's, uh, the numbers have come down since then, there's no question that this flood of children, uh, a whole other group uh, came Without, uh, with a mother or another accompanied out. So we're talking literally thousands of young children arriving at the U.S. border uh, and overwhelming, frankly, what the U.S. Uh, authorities were prepared to deal with on the border. Um, so while um, this humani humanitarian crisis generated a debate about U.S. border policy and U.S. immigration policy, it also gave us a tremendous opportunity to try to understand and focus on the issues that were driving this immigration from Central America. Central America, as many of you know, is among the most violent regions in the world with uh, three of the five most violent countries uh, in Central America, Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. So the question that has emerged as we've looked at this phenomenon, this humanitarian crisis, the children coming to the United States, is what is the U.S. doing in Central America? What should it be doing? And is anything working? 
this is the question we're always faced with, uh, questions coming from Congress. What are we doing? Why are we doing it? Is it having any impact? And so for the first time, I feel, in a long, long time, we actually have something to say about that question. Uh, USAID um, has had the foresight, um, uh, the vision to uh, ask one of the leading public opinion institutions in this country, uh, the Latin American Public Opinion Project at Vanderbilt University, to carry out an extensive impact evaluation. It would seem like a simple and obvious thing to do, but it's actually quite a complex process that almost no one in the U.S. government, and I th I, my opinion has really never been done before in Latin America, uh, maybe you can correct me on that, but no one has undertaken this really extensive process of trying <coughs> to figure out if what we're doing is actually having an impact. Is it a good thing? Should we be spending more money on it? We have spent roughly somewhere in the neighborhood of $600 million on the Central American Regional Security Initiative, as much as $120 million uh, in community-based uh, crime and violence prevention programs in Central America. And so the taxpayers, Congress, everyone wants to know, is it worth it? Should we be spending more or should we uh, stop and spend it on something else? Uh, and so I'm thrilled that today we have with us enough, uh, two people who have been involved in this process of an extensive impact evaluation who will give us some results, some ideas uh, of how to answer these questions for the first time. We're joined, and let me introduce our two first speakers who will present the study, the results of the study, uh, and then we'll have a panel uh, to follow, a little bit of a discussion, and open up time, open up the uh, time for questions from you all as well. But we're joined by two of the luminaries of the Latin America Public Opinion Project, uh, Mitch Seligson, who is the founder and currently senior uh, advisor to the project and was the lead uh, investigator in this uh, impact evaluation in Central America. And then also Elizabeth Zeckmeister, who is the director uh, of the LA POP program at Vanderbilt L University and an associate professor there as well. So I'm going to invite the two of them to come up, uh, introduce the study, the findings, their their thoughts on recommendations, and then after that, we'll take a little break and bring up our panel for a bit more informal discussion. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Eric, and thank you all for coming. And it's it's uh, I just want to uh, thank Cindy for inviting us to to um, to be here again at the Wilson Center. Um, We'll be dividing the presentation into two parts. I'll be presenting the information about uh, why we did it and, and what we did, and Liz will be telling you uh, what we found. Um, it comes as no surprise to anyone in this room or the people seeing it on video that Central America is indeed a very violent place. We have the U.S. figures here of less than fewer than five uh, people per 100,000 are recorded as international homicides in the United States. And the rates in Honduras are 18 times that. Okay, so these aren't just sort of more or less. These are enormously high figures. So that's the reason why the USAID has been involved in trying to do something about this problem in these countries. The U.S. government has been spending funds. The uh, total funds here of $640 million between FY08 and, and 13. But of that, uh, USAID, the part that we're interested in here, has spent $175 million. The goal has been to reduce crime and violence and improve security in Central America by strengthening community, and I want to underline that because that's the focus of our work, community capacity to combat crime and violence, and that's and by creating ed educational opportunities for risk at youth. So that's the core. Keep that community in mind here when you're at wondering about what was done and what the impact was. All this work really began First, there was a meeting with the Social Science Research Council and later the National Academy of Sciences. I had the good fortune to participate with a group of six scholars working on the question, can AID measure its impact in democracy and governance? We know it can measure its impact on things like life expectancy. We know it can measure things like, like uh, fertility rates and birth rates. Those kinds of things are easy to measure. But can it measure things that are much harder to deal with, such as a crime and violence prevention program? 
And so this report was produced in 2008 after a two-year effort with the National Academies, and I participated in that, and AID came to us at Vanderbilt and said, you want to put your money where your mouth is. That is, do you guys think that you can actually implement the recommendations in this report? We um, swallowed hard and said yes, and we began the effort. So let me describe what that effort is. The research design involves a lot of components, um, and so you'll need to pay a little attention to see what we're doing. It's multi-year. We actually began the focus group work in 2009, but in 2010 we began systematically to measure attitudes and behaviors, uh, and it ran through 2014. We finished the last data collection in March of 2014. It's multi-country, involving El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Panama, and it's subnational in focus, that is, individuals and neighborhoods, we're collecting data at both levels. And we use an experimental design, treatment and control. The standard methodology used in the natural sciences ported over into the social sciences where we can't put people in laboratories, but we can, in fact, carry out experiments. Treatment and control group and comparisons with the America's barometer to which Eric was alluding earlier. A large survey of nations this, this year, more than 26, 28 nations around the, in the Americas are being surveyed uh, by us. The design was a mixed method approach as well. Quantitative information at the level of individuals in the neighborhoods and qualitative information, systematic observation of the neighborhood level, semi-structured interviews, uh, and with groups and implementing partners. What kind of data did we get in total? Here's a very, very um, global summary. Four countries, over 29,000 individuals were interviewed at the neighborhood level, and 848 stakeholders were interviewed in extensive one-on-one -on -one uh, interviews that uh, took place throughout the region. We carried out 44 focus groups throughout the process, and then we had this split of neighborhoods, treatment and control, 65 treatment and 62 control spread over those four nations. Why didn't we take the route of just using police data? If we're trying to measure impact, why don't we just go down to the cops and ask them, well, what's the crime rate here? There are a lot of reasons for that. Perhaps the most important is that reporting crime is inversely related to the amount of crime. Consider this chart here, where Panama, where we have the lowest level of crime in, the, in, these, in these four countries, has the highest rate of people willing to talk to the police and report a cr uh, having victim, been a victim of crime. The other extreme is Honduras, where you have the highest crime rates, we know that, but we also have fewer than one-fifth of the population willing to, to report the crimes to the police. Also, there's a, uh, uh, questions of, uh, you know, the figures that you see are homicide rates. We obviously can't be interview people who have been killed, but extortion is something that people don't like to report for a whole variety of reasons, not the least of which is that the concern that the police may be involved in the extortion to begin with. We have a lot of weak data at the neighborhood level. We have gro global data for the country. We have some data at the municipality, but at the level that we're working, at the municipality, it's pretty hard to get accurate data. And then we want more than the police can give us. That is, just the recording of a burglary or robbery doesn't really tell us everything we want to know. We have a lot more information in terms of issues such as people's fear of walking through their neighborhoods. We can't get that out of the police reports. So this would have been the easy way to do it. We took the harder way. First, we went out and selected neighborhoods, and this is what is really unique. It took a lot of courage on AID's part to let us be in the driver's seat. That is, rather than being told as evaluators, go here and go there and the other place, AID selected municipalities in each of these four countries. I'll show you a map briefly to show you where they are. In municipalities that were clearly problematical for them, they had selected them for a whole variety of reasons that we think were quite good. But once that selection was done, it was Vanderbilt that made the selection of treatment and control. What we did is we gathered universal data, that is we gathered data on all of the communities, all the neighborhoods and all of the municipalities. We got as much information as we could on the neighborhoods and we selected uh, the neighborhoods that had a series of criteria here, unmet basic needs, a higher than average percentage of youths, children not extending school on a regular basis, under and under employment, single parent families, and so on. We excluded those that the U.S. and and other donors were already involved in, so we wouldn't have any contamination. We had non-contiguous neighborhoods, and once we got all that, we just randomly 
selected which ones were going to be treated and which ones were not, not going to be treated. And then we told the implementing partners to go out and apply their medicine to the treated areas and not to the, not to the control areas. We then independently went out and collected baseline data before the treatment began. We collected midterm data and then our final round. The at-risk neighborhoods tend to look like this with problems of lighting, garbage and sewage disposal, abandoned houses. We have lots and lots of photographs that we've taken of the graffiti, which as you know is a special language that's used among the gangs, um, and difficult access and road conditions. But there's a positive side too when we want to record that. There are a lot of resources that are available in neighborhoods, such as police stations, community organizations, churches and schools. And our interviews included interviews with teachers, police officers, people involved in community organizations. Okay. What was the treatment that was applied? It wasn't one single medication. It was a public health model recognizing the problem of crime and violence is complicated and it requires a multifaceted treatment. It involved working with municipalities and committee and anti-violence committees. It worked with crime observatories. Crime prevention through environmental design, street lighting, graffiti removal, I just showed you some of that, cleaning up public spaces. And then a lot of effort at the at-risk youth. Outreach centers, workforce development, mentorships, okay, and community policing. There's a package of things that were applied to see whether as a group, these things could in fact make a difference. This treatment could make a difference. These are the kinds of photographs that come from, for example, some of the outreach centers of kids involved in training, kids involved in recreating in an organized fashion rather than being drawn into the gang. Here's where we did our work. Here's Guatemala. You see the various municipalities. We weren't centered solely in Guatemala City. We worked outside of Guatemala City. When you look at El Salvador, we were dealing with the part of El Salvador closer to the Guatemalan border rather than further away. Um, and we worked in the municipalities there, Zaragoza, Santana, and so on. Here's Honduras, where we did do Tegucigalpa and San Pedro Sula, the two sort of the national capital and the other major city. But we worked in Choloma and La Ceiba also. And finally, Panama, where we concentrated, but as you know, Panama has a strong concentration of population right in that canal zone that is San Miguelito and Panama, and on the other side, the other coast, Colón. That's what we did the study. Okay, I will now turn this over to Liz, who will tell you the methodology we used and what we found. Okay, thanks. Is it on? Okay, so the method that we use to assess the impact of the treatment is referred to as a difference in difference design. And to unpack that, I'm gonna walk through a stylized example. The nature of the study is multi-year. And so what that means is that we're looking at change across time. And that fact means that we need to determine how much of that change across time we can attribute to the treatment or the intervention. The way we do this is by observing a control group over time. And so I'm gonna plot that there on the, on the graph in red. That's the control group being observed over time. We then assume that the trajectory of change that we see in that control group over time is what we would have seen in the treated communities absent the intervention, right? So I'm gonna plot that with the dotted green line. And that dotted green line and the value at the end of it become our counterfactual, okay? The counterfactual is the predicted group outcome in the absence of the intervention. This is what we think would have happened in that set of treatment communities if there had been no treatment. So let's assume that, for example, what we actually observe in the treatment community looks like this. Okay. To then determine the impact of the treatment, we want to look at the observed value in the treatment community and compare that to the counterfactual. That difference gives us the change that's attributable to the, the treatment. 
One of the benefits of this design is that it allows us to account for a number of threats to causal inference. One of those is the fact that when we randomly assign a small group of units, in this case communities, to treatment or control, in theory we should achieve perfect balance in the baseline study, meaning that we should find perfect overlap between the red and the green dots in the pretreatment situation. But in reality, and those of you who have flipped a coin 10 times know this, in reality, when you randomly assign a small group of units, you don't always achieve perfect control. And that's why we've sort of staggered the dots there to, to show that in, in reality, there's sometimes a, a bit of a difference between the, the, the starting points. And the difference in difference design accounts for that. The other thing that the difference in difference design accounts for is what we call history, right? So for observing communities over time, we assume that other things may happen as well, right? Events at the macro level, economic downturns, um, shocks from outside the country can affect all the treatment communities at the same time and cause them to evolve in ways that we need to account for in assessing the impact of the treatment. Otherwise, as you see in this example, we might overestimate the, the effect of the treatment. And so to get as rigorous and as accurate an assessment of the treatment effect, we use this difference in difference technique. So the difference in different estimation requires observing the control and the treatment prior to and after the intervention using the control to determine the trajectory of change that we would have observed under non-treated conditions. And then we remove that trajectory of change, that non-treatment trajectory of change, out of our calculations of the treatment effect. And so as I, like I said, this could be something like an, an, an economic downturn at the national level that we want to account for. The treatment effect is then the percent change in the dependent variable relative to its predicted value in the absence of the treatment. So to put that in, in, in sort of words that we can chew on, here's an example. And this is an example from some of the findings that I'll show you. So I've pulled it out to, to, to help us walk through this. So if we predict that all else equal, 20% of respondents in the treatment communities would have reported extortion, but we observe 10%, we report this as a 50% decrease in the likelihood of respondents reporting extortion in the treatment communities compared to what we would have observed absent the, the treatment. And so that's the way that I'm going to present the, the results from the, the, the study today. The results that we're presenting today are based on the pooled uh, data set. Um, all the countries in the Central American region that we studied are pooled here together in the details of the, of the study that we provide in the report itself and in separate reports for each country, we get into the, the specific details for each country. This is the, the pooled set of findings. What do we find overall? Let's turn first to indicators of crime victimization and violence. So here you see the result that I was just referring to. To be more specific, it's 51% of respondents reported, 50% fewer respondents reported being aware of extortion and blackmail in the treated communities compared to what we would have expected absent the intervention. And we receive, uh, we see about the same results for uh, reports of, of, of awareness of murders in these communities. We see that 26% fewer respondents reported being aware of illegal drug sales in the treatment communities compared to what we would have expected absent the intervention. And 19% uh, fewer reported, uh, sorry, being aware of robberies compared to what we would have expected absent the intervention. So we find, in other words, very significant impacts of the treatment across a range of indicators of people's uh, experiences with crime victimization and violence. Mitch mentioned that we also had a qualitative component to this study. And then on the next slide, I'm going to show you some of the, the, the comments that stakeholders in the, in the, in the communities made that, sort of that, that could comport with these findings. But I first want to draw your attention to the bottom of the slide, which provides one of the questions uh, that we asked, just to give you a sense of the, the question wording um, beneath the results that we're presenting here today. So we asked people whether or not they are aware of occurrences of blackmail or extortion in the last 12 months in their neighborhood. And you can see that we sort of have the brackets in the, the name of their neighborhood inserted there in each case. So that we're asking them about awareness of these events in the neighborhood in which they, they live. So here are some of the qualitative findings. These are from interviews with police officers in El Salvador and Guatemala. And you can see that they're reflecting on this change and their reflections on this change comport with the quantitative results so that they also see lower rates of crime in the um, municipalities that, that were treated. 
uh, specifically in the case of Guatemala, the police officer refers to lower rates of robberies and crimes involving, involving drugs. The qualitative research, which we won't have time to go into in detail today, allows us to really unpack and contextualize the quantitative findings. At times it allows us to see the mechanism um, at, at work in the, uh, the sort of, uh, the, the link between the application of the treatment and the outcome that we see in the quantitative results. When we turn to perceptions of security, we also find significant results, improvements on these dimensions. So we find compared to what we would have expected without the, the, the treatment, absent the intervention, residents in the treated communities were 11% less likely to report feeling unsafe while walking alone at night through their neighborhoods. We also see that residents were 5% less likely to describe their neighborhoods as unsafe. Here are some comments from uh, community leaders on that. So right, one of the community leaders in El Salvador says, right now I'm almost 90% safe. And then he goes on, as I said, to unpack the mechanism, right? Because we see that if we see someone who looks suspicious, we immediately call the police so that they can investigate what it is that he's doing and who he is. And so we resolve the problem right, now, right then. And so what you can see is the, the, the perception among the community leaders that increased trust and cooperation with police are underlying some of the results that we see in the quantitative data. We can turn to uh, indicators of per perceptions or awareness of, of neighborhood problems and disorder. So we asked respondents to reflect on the extent to which a number of these factors you see on the screen were problems in their neighborhood. And we, can s we see that uh, we find significant results of the treatment across all these indicators. So for example, compared to what we would have expected without the treatment in the treated communities, we see that perceptions of youth loitering uh, as, uh, as perceptions of seeing that as a problem were 6% uh, lower. Perceptions of gang fights, 13% lower. And we see that 35% fewer respondents report having avoided parts of their neighborhood because of fear of crime in the treated communities compared to what we would have expected if the intervention had not happened. We also see that respondents' evaluations of communities' uh, organizations for crime prevention were 18% higher. This is our last uh, set of, of findings for the presentation today and it has to do with satisfaction with the police and evaluations of government. What we see is that the treatment had an effect on individuals' evaluations of, of police, a positive effect. So compared to what we would expect absent the treatment, satisfaction with police performance was 5% higher and trust in police was 9% higher. What we don't see is an impact of the treatment on evaluations of the government's handling of security. And that gives us some insight into how individuals are attributing responsibility for the improvements that they see as a result of the, in, of the intervention. We have some policy recommendations that we conclude with. First, given the, the success that we see across a broad range of indicators when looking at the impact of these interventions, we come to the conclusion that it that, that it's very easy to recommend making prevention a cornerstone of any effort to reduce crime and violence. And what that means is investing in efforts to scale up these types of programs. It may be that the fight against crime and violence in the region has to be multifaceted. That's, that's, that's probably a certainty, but crime prevention should be one part of that. We find from the qualitative research a number of additional recommendations that we can make. So the additional bullet points don't really come from the qualitative findings I, or the quantitative findings I just presented, but from our interviews with individuals in the community when we were able to, to see the dynamics of crime and violence at play in these communities through a, a, a finer lens. And from those interviews, we conclude that any efforts to increase community-based prevention should include family support for child care and supervision, that these programs need to be very careful to leverage and, and improve and enhance and support school resources, meaning with respect to school psychologists, also with res respect to mediation and leadership programs, and as well training so that teachers and administrators can be aware of and, 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 and offer assistance to children who have experienced violence at home and also be able to cope with children who come into the schools as perpetrators or instigators of violence. 
and we recommend improved community coordination of planning. We see that, that when there's more coordination, there's more success. We uh, recommend partnering with religious organizations. We see the key role uh, that, that clergy and other members of, of, of religious groups are playing in the, in, in the work that's being done to minimize crime and violence in these communities. And we also recommend improving police response and assignment patterns, meaning that the nature of the assignments of police officers to communities needs to be treated with care, and we have more information on that in our, in our reports. The report itself, the full report of the, uh, of the impact evaluation, the regional report, will be online, is online this morning. This is what it, what it looks like. It's a hard copy. You can download it off of our website, the Vanderbilt website that's up here on the, on, on the slide. You can also download it uh, off of USAID's website. Get it set up and uh, have some questions and discussion and you all, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. Um, so if you just bear with us a second, we'll, I know some people are trying to get in. All right, we're gonna, we've invited uh, a, a panel of experts um, to uh, help us uh, start this discussion. I'm gonna start with a few questions for them uh, and then we'll open it up for you all to uh, join in the discussion. Um, let me introduce them again quickly. I mean, we've already introduced uh, Mitch Seligson um, uh, from LA Pop. Um, Associate Administrator uh, Mark Fierstein uh, at USAID. Um, then is uh, Ros uh, Rosanna uh, Arder Ander, who is the founding executive director of the University of Chicago's Crime Lab uh, and the University of Chicago Urban Education Lab as well since 2011 with extensive experience in the U.S. on uh, violence uh, and crime prevention programs. Next, we thought it was appropriate to include a young person, <laughs> not to suggest the rest of us are not young, <laughs> but, <laughs> but somebody from the field, er Eric Esteban Escobar Alborres from Guatemala. Uh, he is uh, one of the founding members of uh, Jóvenes Contra la Violencia, you, uh, viol Youth Against Violence in Central America and in Guatemala runs this program, I'll ask him in a minute to just give us a brief word on that program and what, what it does. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, Joan Sarah Hoffman, uh, who we've worked with in the past, has been, uh, had over 25 years of experience also promoting crime and violence prevention programs in the region and is now working directly with the World Bank on many of these same programs. So we thought she could also bring an interesting perspective 
uh, to this discussion. I'm going to start just with a couple questions for, for, for Mitch uh, uh, based on uh, what he and Liz have presented from this report. Uh, I guess there are two questions for me, Mitch. Um, uh, one is uh, you the report and, and the study is measuring uh, perceptions, if I got it right, uh, perceptions of what's changed in the communities where there's been treatment and so on and so forth. Could you say a little bit more about the importance of measuring perceptions? I mean, there is a perception that sometimes they can be misleading, that they can, you know, uh, people in Uruguay just elected at an elections and one of the main issues in Uruguay was public security. And yet, you know, Uruguay is known as a relatively peaceful and calm place compared to many countries in Central America. So sometimes perceptions can, can get confusing and, and not really give you what you want to know. So uh, d can you explain a little bit about why uh, perceptions are important in this process and measuring perceptions are important? And the second question, and I'll just throw it out there, is um, you also say in the report that this all has had a direct impact on crime. Crime has gone down uh, in these communities. And I'm, I'm trying to figure out how one connects the question of perception with actually driving down crime rates. Uh, you know, uh, how does that work exactly? Or how do you understand that working? And, and why, why should we see this as all a positive? So I'll start with those two. And yeah, let, me, let me answer the second first, and then I'll turn it over to Liz, and she presented the quantitative numbers oh, to, okay. to answer the first. Um, recall that a lot of crime that's going on in the region is crime that uh, emanates from young people. Um, joining gangs often occurs at the age of 10 or 11. And one of the things you have to do to join a gang, like a fraternity initiation right, is commit a pretty serious crime. Um, this project, which tries to, in just one aspect, which is outreach centers, for example, tries to bring the kids into a different environment, is a program in which young people, rather than hanging out on the street corner and being co-opted by a gang, have an alternative, a place where, for example, they can get some training, um, some computer training, some skill sets, okay? and a place to hang out in a much cleaner environment. But the project is, is much broader than that. In our interviews with teachers, for example, we detected that a lot of kids who are misbehaving in school typically would be suspended, home suspension. Well, what do you think happens when they go home? Okay, the parents aren't there, or the parent typically, because these are matrifocal families, the parent isn't there. And so the kids get into trouble. The school psychologist program, which we learned about by talking to the teachers, rather than isolating these kids as bad kids, says these are troubled children. And the school psychologist, according to the teachers, talk to them in the school setting, try to work out the serious problems they have. A lot of these problems, for example, especially we detected in, in, in Guatemala in terms of domestic violence and sexual abuse of the children from their parents and from their siblings. So these are serious heavy duty problems. If you send them home in the old format, they get into trouble. And as we have often said uh, in that our incarceration rate, you know, you put one person in jail, you're not eliminating one crime, you're probably eliminating 20 or 30 or 40 crimes. So that's how a program of focus like this at the neighborhood level, um, not, not distinct from or not in, in uh, opposition to law enforcement, but as a very, very important community-based ally from it, can in fact bring down the crime rate. But remember, I showed you a map. This is not a national program. Right. We're talking about a program that's not gonna move the national dial because it's so, national, because it's so locally centric. Whether, whether that's scaled up or whatever, that's a whole other question, and that's have to do with people that are, you know, we're, we're scholars, we're not policy makers. Could I ask Liz to respond to the other one? front of you, I suppose. <laughs> um, okay, so it's a great question. Let me get back there. No, no, no. Oh, you can go back. Okay. So, um, I mean, really, you're asking, what, what are we measuring, right? And I think, you know, we're measuring a number of different things, and two of those things are reports of crime and perceptions of insecurity. So with respect to reports <coughs> of crime, 
So we're asking them about people's awareness of crime in their neighborhoods. And these are small neighborhoods. So if you think about the neighborhood in which you live, you know, the, ho the ho blocks around the house in which you live or the apartment building in which you live, you often become aware of, of crime in one of a no number of, of, of different ways. When you see the police show up and that starts you talking, uh, neighbors share information through a number of different information channels, children share information. So th these are reports of crime. Um, we also have measures in our, our surveys of people's own individual experiences with crime. Here we focus on, on reports of crime in the neighborhood. Then we get to perceptions of, of insecurity. Oh, so let me just say, so reports of crime focused on the neighborhood, not reports of crime in the country as a, as a whole, but focused on that individual's neighborhood. Then perceptions of, of, of insecurity, also focused at the neighborhood level. How safe do you feel in your neighborhood? We think that this matters. We think it matters because it alters people's behaviors, right? Their, their economic behaviors, their, their daily routines, whether or not they walk down certain streets, whether or not they engage with others in, in, in one way or another, right? But these perceptions are also grounded in a reality. And the Uruguay case is a really nice case to give us. We're just finishing analyzing the results of the 2004 America's Barometer Survey, which will this year include 27 countries across the region. And so we're looking at these, some of these issues of crime and violence across the Americas as a whole. And we do see that in Uruguay, crime victimization rates are reported at a very high level. So is insecurity. These things are connected at the macro level and at the individual level. Those <coughs> individuals who report having been the victim of a crime are more likely to report being insecure. So, th so these are grounded in something. But what are they grounded in in Uruguay? When we dig down deeper and we look at reports of violent crime, v violent crimes such as murders, uh, when we look at crimes such as extortion, crimes that are very prevalent in, in Central America, we do not see high percentages of reports of those types of crimes in Uruguay. What are people in Uruguay reporting? Burglaries, okay? So the types of crimes that people experience across contexts do differ, but Uruguayans are concerned and they're concerned about a particular type of crime. So I think that their, their perceptions of insecurity can be fueled by the media, they can be fueled by all sorts of things, but they are often, um, and I would say they are always grounded to some extent in reality, but that reality differs across countries. Thanks. I, th this reminds me that you know, um, you know, oftentimes when we think of Central America, high crime, ho high homicide uh, rates, we kind of easily conflate that with international drug trafficking and and all these sort of big picture uh, transnational crime issues. And what what you're talking about, as I understand, is really what's happening at a local micro level that could be related in some way to drug trafficking, but there's always very important local dynamics that we're trying to uh, uncover and unravel that may not have a lot to do with that particular issue, so. Right? Yeah, yeah you're right, thank you. Yeah. 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 Our, our, our project was, a, was aimed at the local level, so let's consider for a moment. I asked you, as surveys often do, how's the economy doing? Well, I mean, what do you know other than what you read in the newspaper or saw on TV? I asked you, what's going on in your, in your immediate neighborhood? And we're talking about neighborhoods, in this case in Central America, of 150 to 500 dwelling units. These are fairly small units. So yeah, my, some of my neighbors are unemployed. You know about that pretty well. So that's the kind of distinction between the macro level figures that you're getting and a program that we are trying to evaluate at, which is aimed at the local level, and our evaluation is at the local level. And so the information that we get from the respondent, how is the government handling security, I'm not so sure how much people know about that, actually, but they do know about what they're seeing going on in their neighborhood. Great. Let me turn just for a moment to Mark. I don't know if you wanted to respond to that in any way, but I was going to ask you also, uh, just to put this in a context for us, uh, for USAID, I mean, my impression is this is new, this is innovative, this kind of study has not been done before, at least for AID. Is that true? Is it not? What's the importance of this kind of study and these results for USAID? No, thank you. It's a very important question. Let me try to step back a bit and put this into the greater context. When we're talking about Central America and the Northern Triangle, these are countries we've been in for 50 years. And we continue to put a great emphasis on Central America. In fact, we've been shifting resources in recent years from South America to, to Central America based, based on the need there. The other shift that we've undergone is an increasing focus on citizen security. 
because the studies that we've done, the studies that others have done, such as the IDB, show that leading constraint to economic growth, to economic development, is in fact crime and violence. So we're trying to get a better sense of what works. Because this is really a, a new field for us. If you study development, uh, certainly when I went to school, but even today, you're probably not focusing on crime and violence. And what, this, what we're learning about now in Central America is you need to. We can't succeed as a development agency unless we can also help reduce crime and violence. So what this study helps us do is get a better sense of what works. Now, if you went to Central America a few years ago, you heard a lot about the mano dura. You heard about that from, from politicians, uh, from the business sector, even civil society thought that was sort of the right way to go. We know now that doesn't work. And what this shows is that prevention does, in fact, work. And, and when you go to Central America now, people are sort of embracing that idea, and this reinforces it. What we need to do now is scale this up, uh, scale this out. Uh, we need more resources as a U.S. government, and that's why the president asked for significant resources for Central America from Congress. Uh, unfortunately, Congress um, did not provide those resources, but we will ask again. Uh, we need other donors to step up. But most important, we need these, these countries themselves to step up, to mobilize domestic resources, and to fund these sorts of activities at a much greater scale. Do you feel like you have, um, with this, the recipe? It's just a matter of more money and scaling up and broadening, or is there, are there other things that need to be done? I mean, there were some interesting uh, uh, policy recommendations that came from this. Can you yeah. can you say a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, as, as Mitch noted, this is just a piece. I mean, obviously, you need strong policing. Uh, you need strong the judicial system. If we continue to work on rule of law, if we continue to work on community policing, obviously, there are other agencies from the U.S. government that are working in these areas as well. So there's a whole panoply uh, of things that need to be done. And I think this is really an important first step, this study. But we, we also need to sort of unpack the package. What we know is that these, this package of programs work, and I think one question that we all have is, are there particular interventions that are even more impactful than, than others? And I'm not sure if we know that yet. And look, this is a relatively new field even in the United States. You know, we've had dramatic improvements in citizen security in the U.S. I mean, crime rates are now down to levels that we haven't seen in 50 years. And there's a debate in the U.S. about what's really driving that. And I think we need to better understand. And I think there are, there are things that we can learn from the U.S. In fact, we are drawing lessons. You mentioned that Guillermo Cespedes is here, who is the deputy mayor, mayor of L.A. We are, in fact, drawing lessons from Los Angeles, from Chicago, from elsewhere, and trying to apply those uh, to Central America as well. Let me ask one, one other quick question here about this issue of evaluations. And maybe Mitch will have some ideas as well. But am I... Am I mistaken, aren't all programs funded by USAID required to do some kind of evaluation? Uh, I mean, we spend millions of dollars, and I assume there's an evaluation component in everything we've done. I mean, what, why, what is different here? Why, what, do we, what do we need to keep in mind? Yeah. I mean, we do do extensive evaluations. Uh, at the same time, uh, Dr. Shaw, head of USAID, uh, launched the Youth Aid Forward Agenda which puts a, puts, a, puts a greater emphasis on evaluations and high-quality evaluations. So we're doing it much more extensive way now than we, than we had before. And in fact, if I had my iPhone with me, I would pull out an app uh, that, you can, uh, that you can use. You can see every evaluation that USA is, do is doing. In fact, it's actually not on my iPhone, but don't tell Dr. Shaw that. <laughs> um, but I'm sure every other USA employee it. here uh, has, has, in fact, has it. On <laughs> um, but I think, look, this is a model study. And we do need to be doing more of these, which are basically looking not only at the treatment uh, areas, but looking at control areas as well. And it's challenging to do that in Central America, as, as, our, as our colleagues from Vanderbilt explained. It's even more difficult to do it in places like Libya <laughs> and Yemen and Pakistan, where we are heavily involved. But we are starting to think about how to do that. And I think we'll be able to draw on the success of this, of this particular study and some of the methodology they use to help us uh, elsewhere as well. I think. I don't know if Mitch wants to add to that, but I think one of the things that, that I liked about this is it, you, you went to great lengths to, to establish a baseline before the treatment reform uh, was undertaken. And also, you're measuring impact uh, as opposed to sort of the activities that were being carried out. I find that a lot of times evaluations uh, are, you know, how many people have been served, how many centers were open how many training classes were given, all good activities, but they don't really tell you what impact there's been through these programs. They're just kind of the inputs to that process. 
I think, I think in that regard, <coughs> USAID has gone a, a lot of transformation. That is, I think many of the reports, when we began that work with the National Academy of Sciences, many of the reports that we saw from AID were that way, counting the outputs of programs. So I was a Peace Corps volunteer, and they said, well, we don't want to count as the result of your work how many latrines you dug, okay? Yeah. We want to know how you transform things. So we're dealing much more with outcomes, and it's very important also that the evaluations be independent of the implementing partners, okay? The implementing partners are in a good position to say what they did and how many latrines they dug, okay, how many seminars they held. They're not in as good a position to talk about what the outcome of their work was because of the obvious conflict of interest between what they're doing and their ability to evaluate independently. Um, but I just want to emphasize the last point. Doing this is really hard stuff, okay? Um, I can't tell you how many times, you know, we, w we feel these calls at 10 o'clock at night, the interviewer having a gun put to their head, someone being stripped, people will order interviews and nearly burned alive in Guatemala. You know, w this, was a, this was a project that for, for the four years that it was going on, we didn't get a lot of sleep because it was a constant concern about getting these 29,000 interviews and the risk to the respondents and the risk to our interview teams out there is, is really very high. And so um, uh, it's, it's something not easy to do. But I think that the benefit of it is that we can say that there is an alternative to the arms race, okay? Getting bigger and bigger guns and more choppers and so on. There is an alternative. And an alternative that means that the the approach that AID has taken is in moving in the right direction. It certainly wasn't predetermined. We didn't come in thinking, well, we're going to find this. But when we found it, we were um, pretty impressed. I also want to draw the audience's attention to the fact that in addition to this global report, the, the regional report, there will be put online an extensive report between two and 300 pages uh, for each country. So those of you who want to get into the depths of Guatemala or the depths of the report of El Salvador or, or, or Honduras, there's a great deal of material in there, qualitative and quantitative, that would allow people in this audience who are working in these fields to say, oh, okay, well, how do we, how would we deal with the clergy? For example, our interviews with the evangelical clergy and the Catholic Church and the difference between the programs and what impact this has with the kids, okay? So I think that's very important. Yeah. I think that was another thing that really struck me in reading the report was, you know, how you went into the communities and met with both political leaders and religious leaders and young people and, and all, 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 all walks of life that really gave it a much richer sense of what was going on in those communities. So, Mark? Yes, yeah. I just had one brief thing. I mean, we're obviously pleased by the results. We're proud of the results. But I think the important thing is that we also do sessions like this when we show results um, that don't work, or <laughs> we show programs that were not successful. And I think we need to be we need to be more comfortable as an agency yeah. to sort of publicize that as well, and you know talk about the lessons and make the make the proper adjustments. So what I would suggest is that we commit to doing seminars like this yeah. in advance of getting the results, and then we'll see, see where they come up. Yeah, I think it would be highly suspicious if uh, everything you did worked out perfectly. So I think, and and you know, I think it's a useful way to learn and improve what we're doing. Exactly. Let me jump ahead here. I wanted to g uh, give a chance to our other panelists to to engage here. I want to jump over to uh, Esteban, who is our uh, representative of youth from Central America. A lot of pressure there, Esteban. <laughs> but you, you've been very involved in this organization, Jóvenes Contra la Violencia. Um, I want to ask you just to give us a 30 second uh, uh, understanding of what that organization is. And then, you know, ask your reflections too on, on what's been said, what sounds uh, right to you, what do you think uh, makes sense in what's been come out of this study and where you think people need to be uh, focusing in other issues. Okay, uh, nice to meet you all. Um, youth Against Violence, the main idea is to, to, to get the people, the young people um, to, to in action about the prime uh, prevention violence. And um, getting the, the young people from universities, from those communities, from different cities, but all the young people involved in the prevention programs, also from educational, from um, uh, civil participation, and also for, for employment. And um, we have uh, five years. We began in Guatemala City, and now we're in all seven countries in Central America. And now we're working together um, in, in the same areas, in the, in the community level, and also to make it um, 
political, incidental, and also to create awareness to all the community because we need to involve all the people. Um, not also, not also the, the, the well, I, I, I find a myth here like the private sector where they, they are an important part of, <coughs> or of this uh, alliance that we have to do in order to, to, to work in the, in, the, in the prevention of violence. 30 seconds. <laughs> well, good. Well, I mean, you know, given your experience over the years, I mean, what have you seen that really works uh, in terms of helping young people feel safer, feeling more uh, like there's hope, reason to uh, continue to stay in their homes and go to school and try to get jobs? Because at some level, you know, we're faced with tremendous violence. They're faced with tremendous violence, and it's easy to give up and come to the U.S. and try to reunite with their families. So sure, a lot what of have you seen that's yeah. working? A lot of young people, they want to come here to the U.S. And we have some, some program, and uh, we develop a, um, a life plan, and, they and we start with evaluation, and they want to move here and come and work here in the United States. But then, when because they don't like their, their community, they don't like their where they live, so they want to move up. Um, and you know, and uh, when we show them that they are, they have the opportunity to make the impact and make the changes in their communities. They they get they get the uh, you know the commitment to work. And when we show them how they can impact, for example, to I don't know making some cleaning campaign of our communities, and they look those changes, they really care about their communities. So they feel more like they have. They have more, um, you know, they share those kind of experience with <coughs> their friends and also. Um, the thing here is how we involve not only those young people in the communities, how we involve people from the universities, you know. We have a lot of a, a um, good quality, um, you know, workers in the university that they need to make some programs before they get the degree. And they are also um, interested in how they can impact in those communities. And also the people from the uniform of the communities, they want to be like, you know, they want to, after that, they want to be in the university. And they have to be a doctor. They want to be teachers. So they have dreams also. How we create those opportunities to them and how we can make membership groups so they can feel part of some community and how they don't feel like they're alone. That's the way we need to, to work, and also um, we also work with the um, with the parents. It's very important, and we let them know that they have a big responsibility for the for their kids, not only the kids, the young people, and also with the um, with the teachers, because it's not only they teach how they can impact their lives, and it's so so interesting the result that we have seen. Uh, Rosanna, let me turn to you um, uh, because you've had extensive experience uh, in Chicago and I, I, I think other places as well looking at the dynamics of crime and violence. Obviously, Chicago is going through, has been going through a very rough period of time with high homicide rates, uh, nothing compared to what they have in Central America, but nevertheless very, very disturbing. So tell us a little bit about what you've seen working in terms of crime and violence prevention in Chicago and not anywhere else, and how you know how this interact would be uh, somehow uh, useful or valuable, and what you've seen in the Central America uh, presentation today. What what coincides? What doesn't? What doesn't seem to jive so well? Great. Um, well, thanks for the opportunity to be here. I really do feel like the least qualified person on the panel. We have been primarily working in a U.S. context. Um, and in Chicago and in a few other cities. Um, but I, reading the report, it was incredibly heartening to see the, the findings, but also the, the signal that this sends about the importance of not just law enforcement interventions, um, but really identifying uh, prevention and intervention opportunities. And that really has been the hallmark of the work that we've been doing in Chicago, is really identifying sort of what we would call secondary prevention. So not necessarily universal interventions, but really trying to focus in on young people who are uh, maybe through their behaviors kind of raising their hands and showing you that they're at risk for a particular um, potentially bad outcome. So whether it's disengaging from school or starting to get accumulate arrests, um, uh, 
really sort of showing you that, that if we don't intervene, we may miss an opportunity and it's gonna be bad for that young person and bad for the larger community. And so, um, you know, I think at least in the US, people have been very quick to sort of come to the conclusion that if we don't fix it in early childhood, that we've missed the opportunity to change outcomes. And I think the sort of collective body of work that we've been doing, I think, um, sends hopefully is starting to send a pretty resounding message that it's not too late to intervene and that there are things that can work um, even for kids who uh, and young adults um, who are starting to become deeply entrenched in some of the problematic <coughs> behaviors. So, you know, we've evaluated a program called BAM or Becoming a Man, which is for um, young men. It was developed sort of organically in Chicago to respond to some very specific things going on there. Um, so young people who were disengaging in school, growing up in very violent neighborhoods, and in fact, the homicide rate in some of the neighborhoods actually is comparable to central, um, some of the countries in Central America. So the Englewood neighborhood has a homicide rate that's probably 60 per 100,000, which is not that different than um, at least the countrywide homicide rates. Um, and so that intervention we found, uh, and it's not super expensive, because I think another kind of question for USAID um, is really not just what's effective, but how can you have the most impact per dollar invested so you can do the most good. And so finding interventions that really can be scaled. And so the Becoming a Man program is one program that at least in the Chicago context, um, we think has the potential to scale, um, but the sort of lessons learned from that um, may apply beyond just Chicago. You know, definitely context matters. But there are also certain developmental things that regardless of what country you're from, adolescent brains develop the same way. Um, and so really identifying those windows of opportunity to intervene. Um, so, so I think, you know, certainly uh, we, we hope that there are lessons that we're learning from Chicago that will apply across contexts. You'll have to sort of tweak things. But I think there's a lot of um, opportunity to really intervene um, with, uh, particularly with adolescents and um, really see positive impact and impacts that definitely pass a benefit cost test. Um, and so I'm, you know, again, really, really heartened by the, the study that's been done and again, hopefully the dir direction that that means that uh, future aid will be going. Because I think one lesson from the US is uh, mass incarceration or using that as the only lever uh, is uh, uh, pretty limited and has enormous social costs. And so really finding what that sort of portfolio of responses is and kind of learning and iterating over time. Um, and each year, hopefully, you'll learn something more about what is working particularly well and what's not. And then you can sort of adjust your investments accordingly. Are there particular interventions that you've seen work particularly well in the context that you work in? Yeah, so the, you know, two interventions that we're studying right now, one is uh, called Becoming a Man. It's a sort of a cognitive behavioral therapy group-based intervention. Um, it's a male, adult male who does the intervention. It's based in the school, so you get pulled out of a class for one hour a week and you have a um, kind of a group-based session with, with peers, usually 12 to 15 kids. Um, in that intervention, we saw a 44% decrease in violent crime arrest, and it was a randomized control trial, um, for the young people who were offered the program compared to their peers who were in the control group who were eligible, but we didn't raise enough funding to basically offer everybody um, the opportunity to participate. Another intervention that we're really encouraged by um, is actually focusing, so the BAM program is uh, non-academic. It's not trying to make you a superstar student. It's dealing with the kind of life skills um, that young people need, uh, especially when they're growing up in very challenging and harsh neighborhoods, um, to hope, hopefully give them a leg up and, and give them the skills to navigate those very challenging environments. Um, another intervention that we're studying is actually a math tutoring program, of all things. Um, we know, and I think this is not just in the US context, but um, uh, really across the world, that a high school diploma is just massively protective against all kinds of bad outcomes, including crime and violence. And at least in Chicago, one of the, one of the many, but a very significant barrier to getting a high school diploma is getting your math credits in high school. If you don't get your math credit, you fail. You, you can't get a high school diploma, and in ninth grade, once a kid fails their math class, they kind of know the writing's on the wall and they end up dropping out. So in Chicago, the high school graduation rate for young men of color is about 39%. So we're missing huge opportunities to really um, ensure that they're getting a high school diploma. So we found a program uh, that does one hour a day um, of math tutoring 
two kids to one tutor, so incredibly intensive. And when we combined that with the BAM program, we saw that it, it basically increased their likelihood of graduation, or predicted graduation by about 50%. It closed about 60% uh, of the black-white test score gap um, and just had very, very significant impact. So now we're doing a much larger scale study. And again, I think another kind of important point that that highlights is we think of crime prevention as the purview of the criminal justice system, and there are lots of other levers that we have. And so schooling is, I just think, one of the most important levers out there. I, I know it's very different the, you know, in, in the U.S. The school day is longer, um, so I, but I think there are opportunities to really think about um, increasing schooling as an uh, important part of the violence prevention portfolio. Great. You want just, one, sure. just one comment in that um, you talked about targeting uh, kids but and, and the more general intervention. In Central America, what we discovered is, is there a police officer at the school when the kids go in in the morning, and since they have split sessions in many places, midday and in the afternoon, uh, the teachers tell us over and over again, they need a police officer there so that the people who patrol are not the gangs, okay, who grab the kids when they come out of school, either threaten them or recruit them or sell them some drugs or whatever. That's So that's a, a pretty inexpensive treatment, and yet the police officers tell us, well, we don't have the patrol cars, we don't have the gasoline, we don't have the officers, and so on. And so you can you can create an environment around the school to make it safer. And I, I love that that idea of that, that you know the, the ninth grade barrier. You don't get them the meth. And then, uh, as far as I know, that's not part of what's gone on. But the people in the outreach centers told us that they want higher level skill training than they're getting there. I wouldn't be surprised that they would really receive well training like of the type you've described. In other words, they need a higher level training because they're trying to prepare for the 21st century market not for the sewing skills and the and the auto repair you know of the past uh, they're trying to deal with the computer world and the informatics world of the of the of the present great thank you i, I want to just turn then to joan um a uh, couple of questions joan you you work now uh, primarily with the world bank am i right yeah and uh um USAID. i guess huh? and usaid very closely on and a lot of joint initiatives but I guess I wanted to ask you a little bit, uh, two questions in terms of kind of the World Bank, not their, you know, yes. uh, from that at that from that perspective. <laughs> One is, how has the bank dealt with this issue of evaluations? Has it been something that's been increasingly integrated, and how have you dealt? How has that been dealt with there? And secondly, um, the countries, especially the Latin American countries, the Caribbean countries, how open have they been? to seeing this issue of crime uh, and violence as part of the development agenda that, that, that Ma what Mark raised. You know, we don't usually think of it as part of the development agenda. This is something for the police and the military to handle. Um, how, how's, the, how's that discussion uh, gone uh, in, in the bank and with the countries? Well, in terms of evaluation, I think the bank is also refocusing a lot on measuring impacts. Um, and in, in many ways, the field has evolved with um, great uh, academic and uh, policymaker contributions over the last decade or so that for now we, we're beginning to have the tools to be able to measure impacts. I mean, 10 or 15 years ago, if you were trying to do uh, deep, complex community level interventions, the toolbox was rather slim. And even for individual level interventions, we would have a lot of information on early violence prevention, but not so much in terms of what are some of the programs and um, policies that might work for older youth and what would be the best way to capture the, the necessary changes that would essentially lead to this cessation of, of violent and delinquent conduct. So I think the bank is moving very strongly in that direction. Also moving forward, the bank is um, emphasizing a lot um, redefining its, its mission really to be a solutions-oriented bank. And so in that sense, the inquiry and evaluation has to be around concrete, life-changing results. Um, in, in the violence prevention work, the bank's approach early on, um, really sort of the signature approach really was linking violence through urban upgrading and community-driven development. So I think that was probably one of the uh, big contributions of the bank in, in terms of um, bilateral and or bi multilateral approaches to, 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 to the problem. As we move forward, we recognize that while uh, 
focusing on urban upgrading, built environment intervention, situational prevention is very important and also um, making sure that community mobilization processes and interventions have their rightful place. We also need to be able to incorporate interventions that include human development, education, criminal justice, enlighten and inform criminal justice and policing. So we see a, a, a shift um, in that direction. Uh, in terms of the challenges was the other question? Yeah. Um, I think there are substantial challenges in so far that if you are now measuring impact, you are in many times developing a process of inquiry and engaging practitioners and policymakers in a very arduous task for which they're not properly compensated. And they have emergencies every day to, 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 to quell. I mean, even when I was working in the city of Boston, it's like, well, do we pay attention to the Harvard evaluator or do we go quickly to the latest outbreak of community dissent in this particular community? You know, you only have eight hours in a day. <coughs> so we really need to invest much more in fortifying the operation, the sort of like the operating systems for this enhanced knowledge, which is how do we support practitioners and build constant bridges between practitioners and research. This also means realigning research so that it's much more pertinent and respectful of policymakers' imperatives, um, building the capacity. An example would be in our one of the programs that we're, we, we have, it's an urban upgrading project that has redefined social and community development more broadly and it's iterative in its second phase. Uh, we are working with the government of Jamaica to fortify their uh, violence interruption program. And so we, we are now trying to, through a series of fellowships and through targeted uh, collaborations, bringing in practitioners and researchers that have developed uh, more tested in, in violence interruption approaches elsewhere in Chicago and working closely with the ministry, figuring out how can we adapt this, what are the skill sets that you need, how do you develop the data infrastructure to capture um, sort of the changes that, that may be uh, resulting as a, as a result of this intervention and moving forward. And so um, in the quest also, we need to develop a perspective, and this is something that we're going to be working with with the University of Chicago and the, the new JPAL Crime Initiative, a research agenda that looks at what are the most pertinent crime and violence reduction issues and what's the role of impact evaluation in this? What are the populations that you need to focus on? I would say the secondary and tertiary level prevention in the higher risk communities. We know that's where the impact is greatest. Also to look at how we can begin to put together a package or a multimodal package of, of interventions, the portfolio that Rosanna talks about. So I think there's a lot of work to be done but I really want to congratulate you for um, having started this at an institutional level and also offering the opportunity for us to comment uh, openly on it. So I'm sorry if I went on too long. No, no not at all. <laughs> um, we're going to open it up here for public questions. Um, I understand Mark has a leave at 1030. Um, I was going to just throw one more question at him just to give him a chance to uh, – um, I mean, one of the things that comes up here is this is incredibly complicated, dangerous, expensive. Uh, you know, is it worth it? I mean, is, uh, I I mean that's going to be more money. That's going to require more time and effort and maybe even slow things down to some extent. Uh, and, you know, budgets are tight, and maybe, maybe this isn't worth it. Well, I think it's more costly not to do it. <coughs> and obviously we're seeing the impact – on economies and just the social fabric in Central America. We're seeing the immigration impact, and you began this session by talking about the numbers of unaccompanied children who are coming here. And the President himself, President Obama himself, has been very clear about the best way to combat this. You know, we can e either uh, make relatively modest investments in these regions, or we can spend a lot more money on our side of the border uh, dealing with the uh, children who are, who are coming here. Uh, so, you know, I, I think that, you know, again, I think there's a, a, an emerging consensus about the importance uh, of doing this. Um, I do think we need to, you know, not only mobilize our own resources, uh, but encourage these countries to do the same. Like we all know that all three of the countries we're talking about have very, very low tax collection rates. And as much as the United States can do, and as much as we hope to increase our budgets 
ultimately the solution is going to be a, a locally driven one. And it's really a matter of you know, governments having the political will and the technical know-how uh, to increase their tax collection rate. Uh, it's going to require investments by business. And I think that's actually one of the most important and encouraging developments we've seen. That the private sector understands that they can't simply um, you know, put up uh, higher, higher private security guards and, and put up gates. They need for their own profits and their own interests uh, to invest in communities uh, so that uh, you know, people are living in a more prosperous way and have, have you know, resources to spend on, uh, on product and, and stay in their country and don't, and don't depart. So I think we're definitely moving in the right direction, but there's still a, a ways, uh, ways to go. But I think if in, in terms of this is, this is probably the most economically efficient way to combat the problem. Good. Okay. All right. Um, I'll take some questions. Um, right here, w wait for a mic because there are people – Online, where did our mics go? <laughs> All right, Cindy, can you wait? Should I give this gentleman a mic? Sorry about that. <laughs> Hi, uh, Jim Michael. I'm an independent uh, consultant in development. Uh, it seems to me that we've learned a lot about the complexity of the environment within which development occurs or doesn't occur, and the limit of what a donor's intervention can mean for the broader uh, outcome, development outcome. This seems to me is a very valuable example of an approach to dealing with citizen security issues, which are a big impediment to development in this region. And the question I have is now what do you do with this very valuable <laughs> study that has been done that looks at an approach that shows a lot of promise. Is this report in Spanish? Is it, it being used in the communities? It is, be, is it being used in dialogue with the governments so that it may be an influence on thinking, on policies, on practices in the region that will be necessary to be at a much higher scale than anything that, that uh, we or other donors uh, can do to support the efforts of those countries to overcome this uh, impediment to their development. Cindy, did you have a question? Thanks. Um, Ken Bjornsson from the Wilson Center. Um, one of the things that comes up over and over again when we talk about the Central American region in Washington is the question of political will. Um, and capacity. In other words, um, the study, I mean, I think Liz and, and Mitch both pointed to um, the success of these efforts and the need to scale up and to, to, to broaden them. Um, do you feel that um, Central American governments, especially in the Northern Triangle, have, number one, the will, and number two, the capacity to do that if U.S. resources were to become more available because that that is a central issue, you know, on, on the hill. Is there the absorptive capacity for you know a, a much larger infusion of, of of money? I think those two questions are primarily directed yeah, to Mark, sure, and you got to run out here in a minute. So why don't we stay with that and then uh, we'll move on. Yeah, let me. I'll start off with the second question. I think we are seeing increasing evidence of political will, and again, as I noted before, I think the countries themselves our understanding that these are the kind of approaches that they need to take and they need to generate their own resources to do it. I think when they're taking steps to do it, you know, we've seen, for example, Honduras impose a security tax, which I think is an encouraging uh, example. And we hope to see, hope to see m more of that. But I think that the, the, the challenge here is, and we talk about scaling up and scaling out, but there's also a piece which is just better targeting. And what we know from the United States, and I think Central America as well, in, in, and really anywhere in the globe, is that relatively few people commit the vast majority of crimes. And one of the great lessons we've learned from Los Angeles <laughs> is that there are tools that, that, are, that, we can, that have been developed that we can use to identify those youth that are most vulnerable and most likely to join a gang and then develop the appropriate programs to prevent that from happening. And it's worked extraordinarily well in Los Angeles, and Guillermo might want to say a little bit about this, and we're starting to apply those lessons now in Hon Honduras. In fact, last time I saw Guillermo, we was in Honduras. <laughs> and we're, we're applying those elsewhere in Central America. 
I think there are important lessons that could be learned from, the from some of the Chicago work, particularly on violence interruption. I mean, basically having people intervene in communities to avoid violence from spiraling, spiraling out of control. And again, these are very, very targeted efforts. They're not that costly. Um, so I think there are, obviously we talked here a lot, lot, hear a lot about, lot about development, um, but there are more narrow things that can be done as well and that aren't that costly, that can, that, can, that can make tremendous gains in a very, very short amount of time. At least that's what experience would suggest. Uh, on the first question, we are doing uh, a lot to disseminate this study. And I'm actually going to ask Enrique Roy, who was introduced earlier, <laughs> Uh, if, he, if he can speak to our various efforts uh, to that. In fact, we're going to have a conference uh, next week in Guatemala. I'll be speaking there. Enrique will be there as well. But perhaps Enrique can speak a bit more broadly to our efforts to disseminate this work. Perhaps that's right. Yeah, I was going to actually put him on the hot seat and ask him to take your chair as you uh, have to depart. So we do that. So first, yeah, I, I apologize. I have to leave early. Uh, but as, as I'm saying goodbye to all of you, if I can say hello to my daughter, uh, who's uh, sitting in Shanghai right now, and uh, watching this uh, webcast. And the lesson here is that even if your child is halfway around the globe, uh, you can still embarrass her. <laughs> <laughs> Good to know. Thank you, Mark. That was a perfect segue here. I was going to invite Enrique to come up. Again, Enrique is the coordinator for USAID of the uh, Central America Regional Security initiative, so very qualified, knowledgeable person to, to join the panel. Do you want to? Sure. So in terms of the, the question about what we're going to do next with the, the report, um, we do have a dissemination plan. Um, actually, next week in Guatemala, we're co-hosting an international conference uh, with the World Bank uh, that we're calling Together for Action, uh, Preventing uh, Youth Violence in the Americas. And so this will be a two-day panel uh, bringing together experts, practitioners from the field, uh, from the world of prevention, um, to talk about best practices, lessons learned. And so we will have a presentation uh, by Mitch there um, of the findings of the Vanderbilt study and hopefully um, a presentation for the President of Guatemala as well. We have seen a lot of interest from countries in the region for the research that was done and we will be sharing this with them um, to further help in terms of the advocacy that we're trying to make uh, with host governments for the importance of this type of community-based work. Um, as part of that advocacy as well, we're trying to promote the idea of better integration between prevention work and law enforcement efforts as well, so that we begin um, what we call place-based targeting, so focusing all our assets in hotspot neighborhoods, bringing together both the prevention work, both the law enforcement targeted at uh, those youth who are in conflict with the law, um, as well as was mentioned earlier, um, efforts around tertiary prevention. So what do we do with uh, uh, kids who want to leave a gang or have left a gang, so re, you know, looking in terms of reentry programs as part of these efforts. Um, so there's a lot going on. Um, this is a really exciting moment, I think, for the field, and um, there will be a lot of uh, promotion um, of the research happening. And in terms of the, the specific question about the translation, so the when I, even though the conference will be bilingual, I'm going to present this in Spanish, and we've actually put that into Spanish already. We have to tweak it to the last slides here. Uh, and now that the, re the uh, regional report is has been uh, finalized, that's also going to be into Spanish. But all the parts of it which relate to the qualitative were originally spoken in Spanish. And in fact, all of our work was in Spanish. So what we have here is a, we had an excellent translator to try to give the feel of what it's like to interview people who aren't university professors lecturing in front of an audience like this, but they're actually just in, the, in, their, s in their stores, in their place of work in the school and they're talking on a tape recorder. And so we already have that in the original Spanish and we plan to put that, keep that in there and then move that through the countries and do a series of dissemination events in each of them. Otherwise, it would be a tree that fell in the forest and, you know. Um, we have another half hour, so let's uh, take a few more questions. Uh, I know there's lots. Let's go in the back of the room here a little bit. Uh, if you would just wait a second. Uh, uh, Alejandra, why don't you, uh, Give, uh, I can't quite see from the light. Is that Tani? <coughs> Tani, and then there's a couple people in the back that have questions as well. Yeah, I'll come to you. Go ahead, Tani. Sorry, I'm in the back. Um, Mitch and Liz and perhaps Enrique, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about one of the recommendations that you mentioned, which is that scale and let community prevention and prevention awareness be part of the path that you're trying to take in the PowerPoint. 
but um, could you all say a little bit more about why you came to those conclusions? And, I'm, and then maybe Enrique could talk about how you're seeing that moving forward. Um, because in the work that I've been doing with, with AID in Honduras over the last six months and uh, uh, conversations I've been having with the IDB and the, and the bank, um, I'm seeing a, a missing link between the sort of the really micro level social structures at the family moving into community before you get to the, to the municipal level. And I'm, I'm wondering if this is what is echoing here or, or what, what you were saying. So thanks. There were a couple questions all the way in the back. If you would just stand up and ask the questions, because I. <laughs> Hi, Alana Marcel, USA. Um, I work on open data here, and I was wondering. Um, to what extent open data is being utilized to empower these governments as part of a reparation process, whether it be opening up data about deaths um, so people can locate their families, or to another extent um, utilizing it for crime tracking so that you can better deploy resources efficiently and effectively. Was there another question in the back? If not, I think uh, John, was that you, John Maestro, um, had a question. We'll take that one and then. Uh, John Maester, retired U.S. diplomat and consultant. Um, it, my question goes to the political will issue. Two of the three governments in question are Mano Dura governments, Honduras and Guatemala, and El Salvador is a little different. My question is, are these governments embracing this enfoque, this focus, this realization? Uh, and if so, uh, do you see any indications of their uh, approaching uh, – United States government necessarily, but it doesn't hurt <laughs> at the State Department, but uh, international uh, uh, financial institutions such as the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, Cooperación Andina de Fomento, people like that who have resources, the Europeans, to push this approach? Okay. Mitch, you want to go first? Let me, let me um, answer part of this question, and it just it came up in terms of getting kids out of gangs. Um, what we didn't pick up on the quantitative information, but we picked up over and over again on the qualitative information, is that um, once you're in, you're pretty much in for a lifetime. It's, it's really, really difficult to get out of a gang once you're in it. You may marry, raise a family, but you're on call to do service for the gang when needed. <coughs> so the, the, the trick is not to get them there in the first place because the extraction process, which we saw uh, it's successful at, at points, that is, I mean, you can obviously get into witness protection program, you can move to the United States, which is a whole ways of other problems, but if you want to remain in your community and still and, 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 and be dissociated from the gang, we have found uh, that the clergy play a very important role in this. Actually, in some cases, it's actually gang members moving over into that category and becoming um, evangelical clergy members. But that seems like the you know the closing the barn door after the after the uh, horses has this has left. That is, you really want to try to get these kids, and I, and let's not forget about the female side of this. Um, these we think of gangs, and we think of a of a male face, but that's a big mistake. Okay, um, there is a for all I know, the numbers are the same in terms of females and males. It's very difficult to get that kind of information, but from everything we can tell. Young girls are getting in these things at the age of 10 and 11, 12 years old, and there are rites of passage, and I don't have to imagine, you can imagine what they are, and I can describe them, you know, we don't have to describe them in, the, in a public forum like this, but they involve that kind of thing. Um, and once that happens, these people are pretty much marked for life. So it's, it's really crucially important for, for the attention to be placed at that young level, to provide options to make the school grounds safe and not a place where they're likely to fall into the hands of the gang. Make the school not deal with the problem of expulsion and, and punishment and the dunce cap approach, but this is a troubled kid. Okay, identifying them early and I was just delighted to hear and I've been reading more and more about that, uh, you know, what the kinds of things that you can change lives uh, by working and sort of saying this is a this is a rotten kid, you know, and when and the and, and the kid's lost. Okay, so that's my stuff for that. Enrique, you can. Yeah, just in terms of the question about families. So, um, you know, at the same time that we've been doing this evaluation, we've always we've been implementing other programs and gaining some experience from those. And so, we are coming to a better understanding, obviously, that the 
the importance that the families and the schools can play in changing uh, some of these negative behaviors that we witness uh, among some of the, these youth um, or some of the other risk factors that they've been exposed to that make them more susceptible to gang recruitment. So things like a critical life event, uh, negative peer influence, uh, lack of parental supervision, these, <coughs> these types of risk factors. So part of the, the pilots that we're doing now with the city of LA and with USC um, is to get a better understanding of what those risk, risk factors are in the context of Central America. And by working with the family, how can we begin to change that dynamic so that youth is less susceptible to gang recruitment or getting involved in some type of criminal activity. So this is something that we hope to continue to explore and invest in because we think obviously it has to be part of the solution. Um, as you mentioned, Tony, I think oftentimes it's been sort of the missing link in, in the work that's been um, done in the region, but uh, we're, we're cognizant of it and we're trying to figure out ways that we can better understand what makes somebody vulnerable. Um, in terms of the question about political will, um, are we seeing it? I would say, you know, in the last eight years, definitely there's been a trend towards um, a better understanding of the importance of this type of work. You know, six years ago, you would talk to governments in the region, private sector, about prevention, and they would just sort of glaze over. I had one experience talking to a private sector person who pulled his gun out of the drawer and said, this is my prevention program. So, I mean, those are kinds of reactions that you would get in the past. You don't get those now, at least I don't, but <laughs> in any case, um, <laughs> I think there's a, a trend in the positive direction. The government of El Salvador, for example, as part of its new strategy, really does uh, reinforce this type of community-based work. Um, we see policies being adopted in Honduras and uh, in uh, Guatemala, and maybe Esteban and, um, and Joan can talk to this as well in particular, um, that I think mark this positive trend towards investing more in this type of prevention work. So it's not, you know, we're not there yet. It's not perfect. There's more we need to do, and I would also you know, advocate for this idea that we need to do more with youth in conflict with the law, so reentry programs for uh, former gang members, because again, those are the ones that are committing most of the crimes in these communities. So if we do spend millions on prevention and sort of leave out the the secondary and tertiary prevention components, uh, reentry, then we're missing um, a major piece of the uh, of the needed solution there. I would like to say in what in in Guatemala, my my country, um, we started 2012 with a vice ministry of uh, justice, and he initiated creating an you know, um, like an application where you can see where all, uh, where are all those um, municipalities where you uh, have no murders. So we, as Youth Against Violence, was asking like, why? We all know that we have some specific areas, you know, like um, like hot spot, hot spots and other things. And um, you know, it was like this kind of conflict between the the the. The organization of the government because they want to show that there is no violence uh, in the rest of the Guatemala. That's true. That's only practices in, in some places. And after that, this year, well, the last year, they changed the the vice ministry for a prevention and violence vice ministry. And we are getting in touch, and now they approve the national policy of prevention of violence. And we are we are fighting during like t five or more than five years. And uh, now we are proud because we have some actions. Now the thing is to see how we can be part of the solution or how we can help the government or, or work together for the action. Uh, it's gonna be the, the next um, conference in Guatemala. But also how we can demand to the Congress the resources for apply those programs in Guatemala. And for example, in Honduras, the, the first uh, general coordinator of youth, guy, youth Against Violence in, in Honduras in 2012 or 11 is now the one of the um, uh, vice minister of security. And she was the, um, the consultant of the national presidential of, of Honduras. And she was also like, let them know the, the you know, in the, in the campaign that the, the prevention of violence was the solution, and she's also a support for the presidential for the for getting the actions for the crime prevention. So, you know, USID support us. You know, at the beginning, how we can, you know, uh, put a, uh, start working together, and also in those communities, we have a, a member of Youth Against Violence. He started with seeing, you know, since he was eight years old, uh, killing people. And um, he also goes to the schools, and we were creating awards to awareness to the schools, and he tells their, he, his lives to, to all the people, and people get identified. 
also the mothers, also the fathers, you know, all the, all the parents, the uncles. So the family is responding to the, to the other question. The family is very important in the communities because young people, they just want to be, they just want to have attention. They just want support for homeworks. And not also for people who are in school, people for that are not in school, what are doing, what are they doing, and we're going to, you know, put them in some places, not only in the morning, in the evening, and how we can create those membership groups and how we can give those opportunities to participate and, you know, to be a musician and all the things that they want. Maybe they want to play guitar. They don't have the guitar. Last time we were in a festival in the city, an important festival, the zoo, um, and they they would like to, to participate as a, you know, a scholarship, ba you know, the bands of, how do you call it, the, the band of escolares de... Yeah, the school bands. They are good of, of the uh, in, 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 in that kind of things, but they don't have the instruments, the instruments of that, so they can't participate. They just need like the support of special things. And uh, we also have a lot of um, support from um, a few, you know, um, people from private sector that also create the, tr the trustability for the people and also from the youth from the young people in the, in the community. So this is very important. Go ahead, yes. I just wanted to add one comment. <laughs> no, it's fine. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I think the political will comment doesn't just apply to the Central American side of the border. I think the political will is also important on this side of the border. You know, I, I think it's easy to see what's happening there as only about the problems that are there and not see the connections back to our policies, our decisions, and the connections. You know, I'm thinking about Guillermo's work in Los Angeles. A lot of the gangs that took root in Central America started in Southern California, and now they have these international um, ties. And so I think really understanding, and not to mention the sort of firearms and other things. So, so there are a bunch of things that, decisions that we make on this side of the border um, that we need to be cognizant of the impact that's happen hap happening there. Um, and so we need to have the political will to really push our policymakers to put resources not just into sort of military strategies, which are important. I think the policing and, and a lot of that stuff, you do need to have that for security, but we also need to recognize the value of putting resources into prevention and intervention programs as well. And then just one comment on the family piece. Uh, you know, even the individual um, interventions, that the interventions that we've been studying in Chicago that target particular kids or, or particular groups of kids, um, all of them have a pretty robust family or parent engagement component, which I think is really, really important. It doesn't get talked about as often. Um, and, you know, it's it, the different interventions all try to get the, the parents engaged in different ways. And it's definitely challenging. And a lot of these parents um, ha have really, really big uh, issues with their facing, and so it's, it's not easy to do, but at least the programs that we've evaluated so far, that's been uh, an explicit component of what they're trying to do. Joan, did you want to add something? Yes, I, I think also if you were to look back in the sort of the history in the evolution of responses to the problem of the sort of youth, serious youth urban crime, um, it's, it's taken essentially 20 years to get to a point where we have enough evangelizers, whether they're and, and not only evangelizers, but um, community activists, mothers, researchers that can talk to you about the role of education, the role of the healthcare, uh, healthcare sector, the importance of youth workers, why you need to have integrated municipal youth violence prevention plans, why it's a national priority, why, some, why this is something that should be of concern to the private sector. In the, in the 1990s, when the, youth, the last big youth epidemic wave uh, hit in the U.S., the common discourse were that these were uh, super predators. Uh, the other one was feral, pre-social beings. And so the first response, I think because there was a, a lack of knowledge that other things could be done, the first reaction is to sort of to lock them up, to contain, to quarantine. And th that's true of a lot of health problems and a lot of challenging populations where people don't understand what the root causes are. More importantly, what are some of the solutions? So. Uh, um, in the region, though, we in the last 20, 25 years, we've have we have some great champions, uh, not only in the U.S., many in many cities in Latin America, mayors, former corrections officers, police chiefs that understand the importance of working um, in ways that are informed and engaged, um, and that can also can be hard on crime, 
and not on the hard hard on the young person who's hanging on the street corner. So um, part of our work going forward, and I think this event in Guatemala is very important, is to try and bring together these, these voices um, so that you can offer those that don't have enough imagination and perhaps don't know what might be some viable policy solutions that can give you short-term, middle-term, and, and long-term results, some of, the, some of the activities that can be done. And so moving forward through in this Guatemala conference, one of the things that we're beginning to explore is, is there a possibility to have a broader conversation, whether it's through an association, a dialogue, a network of seasoned policymakers that have a commitment to addressing youth violence in its entirety? Um, not primary prevention for the good kids, not screening programs that to, to sort of isolate uh, children from good communities from being sort of contaminated by bad kids, um, but have comprehensive solutions and begin to work together. So I think in the next 10 years, we're going to see some great changes. I'm going to give uh, Don Guillermo here a chance to ask a question or make a comment. And please, if you would just stand up, because um, I think people yeah, should. Yeah, just a, a quick comment um, about political will. Uh, it, it, it seems that sometimes we look at political will as a stagnant concept, not a relational one. And I think that this study, in fact, gives us tools to develop more political will. Um, I'm not sure that it would make sense for an elected official to take on a problem that doesn't have a solution right. attached to it. So I think this study is extremely important in unpacking it, um, not going beyond the issue of whether things work or not, but really look at looking at the what are the ingredients that make programs successful rather than the label of the program. So the issue of political will, I think of it as a relational one that um, that involves an ongoing process of building it. And I think this evaluation gives us um, more ammunition, if you will, to build that political will. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this is something that we've struggled with here at the Latin America program. Cindy raised the issue early on. It's, it's not is there or isn't there, but how do you construct uh, the factors that lead to political will to make the right decisions. And I think we have to be realistic here. I mean, I was chatting with Liz at the beginning. I'm sure Mitch uh, knows this well. The countervailing here is that the more violent societies are, the more the public tends to want more iron-fisted approaches. Uh, and so uh, it's a real struggle. All of what you've said, Joan, is correct. Everybody's been on the mark here. There's an answer. There's somewhere to go. There's something to do. But the other side of it is people are desperate. People are upset. They're fearful. And the obvious thing is put these people in jail. Keep me safe. And while that's a you know, logical maybe response to a bad situation, you're making the conversation about what's effective in the long run is a little more comp complicated. But one hidden one hidden slide in this was actually a series of questions that we asked the public about that question. While it's easy to see the public wants to be tough on crime, there's a great deal of sympathy for it when we asked a series of questions, both in this survey and in the American Barometer, about people's approach, that there is a lot of sympathy for trying to use preventative approach rather than punitive approaches. Okay, So it's not that everyone walks around the street with the with the revolver as a solution to the crime prevention program. There's a public, you know, it, and I was, I was, I was delighted to see that, that you see from a political point of view that something that academics do can be useful, and that's, 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 <laughs> that's just a uh, It happens warming. so infrequently. <laughs> You've been four years doing this, and you wonder whether, you know, anything, but that's, that's great to hear. But that, in, indeed, I think there is going to be, there's more support than one thinks to alternatives to incarceration, putting people on, people into isolation, and so on. Great. We have just a couple more minutes. Cup, I'll take two, maybe three questions. One here, <laughs> one there in the middle, uh, and a third one if anybody wants to. Let's keep it short, but let's get them in. Uh, okay, I'll try to keep it short. Uh, first of all, congratulations to all the panelists and to USAID for the accomplishment. My name is Gustavo Payan. I, uh, I'm with the Education Development Center. Um, a very specific question to about the studies, whether they looked at issues of um, attitudes and behaviors of by bystanders. 
and you know just their um yeah i guess their attitudes and behaviors towards uh, you know intervening uh, or doing something in terms of the crime and violence that they uh, witness and the other one is uh, also a specific issue related to stigmatization about the youth specifically as it is one of the uh, especially on on uh, employment or livelihood programs is one of the main issues or one of the uh, critical issues is stigmatization that many of the youth um, suffer from by employers, especially if you know, they're males or coming for cer from certain neighborhoods. So while it will be great to see all the programming addressing those issues in some way or another, I just wanted to ask about issues of stigmatization. Okay, there was a question here right in the middle. Hi, Daniel Bruna, I'm a development consultant. Uh, my first question is, do these uh, evaluations look at the issue of the sustainability of USAID interventions? And uh, the second question is regarding tertiary prevention. Is USAID currently working in tertiary prevention, uh, either as a standalone program or tangentially as part of another program? Uh, and if so, do, do these evaluations uh, look at those interventions? One last question. No, okay, well yeah, there's one in the back. Hi, my name is Ida Rodriguez from the Washington Center. As the Center, American countries are preparing a project for the Northern Triangle with the support of the Inter-American Bank, how they could profit from this report to more effectively target the municipalities which are sending the greater number of migrants to the United States. Great. Um, looked like Mitch wanted Liz to try to answer <laughs> one of these questions. <laughs> Go ahead. Yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to uh, try. I mean, the, I mean, the question about bystanders. I mean, to some extent, in our study, the the community is the bystander, right? And the focus is on the community. So we ask a lot of questions about what people are perceiving, and whether or not they're they're working with their neighbors. Uh, to, to address issues of, of crime and violence, but we also ask about their relationship with the, ch with the police, and I think that that is a critical role that bystanders play. Do bystanders feel that they can turn to the police for help? And what we see is that one of the impacts of the, the study is that we see increased trust in the police and increased uh, willingness to work with the police. And then in the qualitative interviews, we see this really playing out where people talk about where they once were afraid to report crimes to the police, things that happened in their neighborhood or things that happened to a family member for fear, fear of reprisal, for fear of, of just inefficacy. Maybe that's not so much of a fear, but just apathy, right? We see people reflecting on the fact that the, that the interventions increase their willingness to, to coordinate with the police and report back to the police. So that, that just would be one, one way that I can answer your question. And again, the report has a, a lot more uh, richness to it and the individual country reports, as Mitch pointed out as well, unpack that even, even further. Mitch, you want to add anything else or uh, any last no, comment? I, I thought there was a question that I had no idea. Yeah, on the issue of uh, stigmatization, um, obviously, Gustavo, um, as you know, I mean, that's a huge problem in the region, um, particularly those who come from what are considered bad neighborhoods or those who have already you know, been gang involved. Um, and so we do have to do more to change the conversation in the region about um, looking at youth more as positive um, influencers, um, and that's part of the work that we've, you know, tried to do with the Youth Movement Against Violence, for example, is trying to create that, that different conversation, that different uh, way of looking at youth that, um, you know, for the most part has often focused on sort of, you know, these are the problem uh, make you know, the, the troublemakers and, and in particular those who are criminally involved, then, you know, the default has been to, you know, incarcerate juvenile justice um, detention centers in the region, um, you know, are full of, of kids who aren't offered second chance opportunities. There's really a dearth of um, of programs to help them reintegrate back into society. And so that's something that we're also looking at as well um, in terms of what alternatives can we provide to those youth in conflict with the law so that we begin creating a different dynamic. Uh, again, this idea of second chances. And this is something that we're gonna touch on at the conference uh, next week in Guatemala um, as part of this, nas this conversation that we wanna have with our partners in the region. Because um, it, it trickles down, it begins to have impact in terms of what one can do with uh, youth across the board. And so if we don't start changing that dynamic, then you know it's, it's very hard to come up with solutions to the whole um, problem set. Um, the other question in terms of are we doing anything on tertiary with uh, re-entry? We have in the past. Uh, we're doing some small pilots now. It's something that we do want to do 
more of in the future as it relates to the juvenile justice system. So again, focusing with those kids who come out, how do we set up programs that will provide certain services to them to help them reinsert back into society. So going forward, we see that as part of sort of the, the medicine, the treatment that needs to be um, applied in addition to the community-based work that uh, was evaluated under, the under this study. Can I just say one thing about stigmatization, which may be a little, I, I don't know if it's on point or not, but one of the things that um, I think has been important in the work that we've been doing in Chicago, we've been trying to focus on kids who are, are at elevated risk for violence involvement, some of whom who have criminal justice system involvement. And we've been concerned about if we offer them, or we're, we're working with program providers, if the program providers um, are offering the programs and the kids perceive themselves as being at risk or the bad kids, um, would they want to participate? So they've been very, very thoughtful, the program providers, in not framing it as you're a bad kid so you need this program, but really making the program something that any kid would want to be involved in, but really thinking about how do you en engage the kids who are probably not the ones that normally sign up for interventions. And really, I think it, it's just an important insight for program providers to really think about, um, you know, especially if you want to focus on kids who are really at elevated risk or have, um, you know, gotten into trouble before, how do you make the program something that all kids would want to be a part of so they don't feel singled out? for the negative reasons for being a part of it. And I, I think it's the both BAM and, and shockingly, to from my viewpoint, the math tutoring program. There are kids knocking on the door trying to get into the programs because it's a cool program to be a part of. They like their tutors. Their tutors have become mentors. There are kids who want an extra hour of math tutoring. Um, and so really figuring out ways to, to make the programs engaging for young people is just important. Can I, can I just ask you to reflect on one other issue that came up, and that is the relationship between these kinds of prevention programs and law enforcement. How has that kind of been handled in the case of Chicago? How do you get, in some ways, how do you get the police on your side as well, as seeing this as a, a positive for them as well in their war? Or maybe, you know, or not, I don't know. Yeah, so um, Gary McCarthy, who's the police superintendent in Chicago, from day one, uh, I, I think, had been saying pretty uh, uh, vocally that we can't solve the crime problem in Chicago with the police department alone, and that it really is, um, you know, w by the time the police department gets involved, we've often missed opportunities. And so I think um, the, the city really has begun to sort of take take that to heart and try to identify um, interventions that um, can have an impact on the crime and violence problem or using other levers um, of the system, not just relying on the police only response. So, you know, I, I think the police department has been incredibly supportive. They're not directly involved in these programs necessarily, but they uh, definitely are aware of them and, you know, are writing letters of support if we're going to apply for funding, have pr participated in um, presentations when we present the results, talking about how important it is for the private sector, the funders, and the public sector to be investing in these programs as a very important part of the crime prevention strategy for the city. Thank you. Uh, Esteban, I is that idea of police in Guatemala understanding the importance of prevention work is and what you all do in your organization, is that something that gets discussed at all? Yeah, sure. Um, I will. I will. I'm glad to let you know that, for example, we have some programmers in in the in the organization that volunteers, and we create a, a campaign, awareness campaign named the Scarecrow. It's a it's a scarecrow uh, dressed by a, a po like like a police, um, identifying those hot spots where you can be victim of violence, and um, we. We can see that we don't ha we don't trust in the police, for real. We don't trust in the police because they can rob us. They can. It's it's very difficult. But the thing is, how we can get involved as a youth with the police and with the community as a solution again. So we are looking for for those um, seminars and those um, approaches between the community, the youth people. How we can know each other. We have some. Uh, we just have the uh, the last month uh, uh, meeting with the uh, National Ministry of Security, and we proposed the, that application because was was so big the, the the awareness campaign two years ago, 
and we are develop that application that application that you can make a report and you can see where are the, 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 the points that you can be victim and also how you can make a, a police report you know because we, we don't trust in police we don't we don't have we don't we, we don't used to make the the police reports so how we can start it in a um, civil platform way that can introduce us to 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 create that relation with the police and also how we can get the support is is not USAID or the mu municipality to approach to the ministry of government is the youth people approaching with the the ministry so that makes difference and also is the the youth people approaching with the with the mayor of the city and also with the leaders uh, um, you know uh, sectors so it's very interesting how we're going to make this happening and how the ministry of security is so glad to work with because uh, also politic poli you know the people can see it as a as a good politician and that also is is a win win so it's very interesting how we're going to get the approach between the police, how the police can uh, feel that we are looking at them, and how the people can see that the police are looking to, to the people too. Yeah, and I think you remind us that it's really important to involve the youth in these processes. It's not just a governmental problem, it's not just a top-down, uh, as, as useful as we academics like to think we are, involving the youth in the actual process is, is incredibly important. Joan, you won't you would have the final word unless Enrique has a, a brilliant final comment as well. Well, Enrique has lots of brilliant final <laughs> comments. I wanted to just um, really highlight the importance of the work that Jóvenes Contra la Violencia are doing. I, mean I think in, 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 in the U.S. certainly it was civil society, young people, mothers, and community activists that elevated uh, violence um, to the public policy agenda in cities with, with foundations and eventually trickled up to the federal government and then it jumped over to the development agency. Um, so uh, their role is, is critical. And it's not um, one that is, um, I think, sometimes sufficiently appreciated. We have a problem in many contexts of th that we offer youth programming, particularly for older youth, that is unappealing, that isn't able to retain kids past the age of 12, you know, and to start beginning to challenge. And so for, for the necessity to be able to do our youth work, we've had to really listen to young people to make suggestions about how to enrich the programming. How do we create those dialogues with, with the police? How do we um, engage young people in efforts to rebrand communities so that it's not only young people that are stigmatized or communi the communities from which they live, how can you create new opportunities to be uh, part of a, of a broader society? So. Um, I think the issue of youth participation is not, it's not an afterthought. Also, if you look at the civil rights movement in the U.S., yeah. it was young people that <laughs> desegregated the South. Um, you know, and so um, to the extent that we can provide the knowledge that we've had um, and, and fortify these great uh, leadership uh, structures, it's fantastic. Great. Well, let me thank our panelists uh, for their participation. For those of you that traveled, I uh, greatly appreciate it. Special word of thanks to USAID, our partners in this event, Mark Kirstein and Enrique Roy, Liz uh, and Mitch for your tremendous work on this. It's really exciting stuff and I appreciate that. Uh, and all of you who came, spent a couple hours, I think we could have gone on much longer. And I also want to thank my colleagues from the Wilson Center, uh, Alejandra Guetta, uh, Christine Zeno, um, Veronica Colon, and our crack AV team that had to do a lot of dancing around here with two big events at the same time, but really appreciate their, their help as well. Thank you all very, very much. <laughs>